Welcome to the DFO Rundown Podcast with Frank Saravalli and Jason Greger on dailyfaceoff.com. Delivered by DoorDash. Welcome to episode 75, the Hal Gill episode of the DFO Rundown. I'm Jason Greger alongside Frank Saravalli. And of course, uh, there is lots going on uh, in the National Hockey League uh, surrounding the, uh, the Chicago Blackhawks. Uh, you know, scandal, fiasco, cover up. Uh, there's so many different uh, words that you want to use to describe it. Uh, all we know is it would uh, it had a tragic result with, of course, Kyle Beach, who uh, came out earlier today and announced that he was indeed uh, John Doe. So we'll get to uh, all of that. But first, just want to uh, remind everyone, uh, this episode brought to you by our friends at ESPN Plus has become a must-have for hockey fans. Get access to more than 1,000 out-of-market NHL games and 75 weekly national games all season long. Plus, stream thousands of live events from the best leagues and the biggest tournaments in the world. Exclusive originals, the complete 30 for 30 library, premium articles, fantasy tools, and more with ESPN+. Plus. It's your best way to watch the games in the United States, so sign up now at ESPNplus.com slash DFO. Don't forget the slash. Frank, welcome to the pod. How are you doing? Whew. What a tough week it's been. I can't imagine what it's been for Kyle Beach and his family. Um, you know, this has been a heavy, heavy week. Anyone associated with the game, in the game, uh, hockey feels like at this moment it doesn't really matter right now. Yeah, and, and that's fair. And, you know, the story, I guess there's a another layer of it to it. To, and that's what we'll announce right now, of course, that uh, Joel Quenville has resigned as head coach of the uh, the Florida Panthers. Uh, sounds like uh, Andrew Burnett, who's an assistant coach, is is going to take over. And Frank, this you know, we had a lengthy meeting with uh, with Gary Bettman. Joel Quenville, of course, was the head coach of the Chicago Blackhawks in 2010 in the playoffs when uh, the the incident with uh, Brad Aldrich occurred when he sexually uh, misconduct sexually assaulted Kyle Beach. And now, uh, 11 years later, uh, Joel Quenville is no longer the head coach of the undefeated 7-0 Panthers. Another domino continues to fall, uh, and a massive one. When you think about this moment, this is Joel Quenville, the highest paid coach in the league, the second winningest all-time, three-time Stanley Cup champion, uh, resigning after this meeting. And it was quite clear, and Gary Bettman put in a statement that all parties agreed that this was the best decision. It wasn't possible for Joel Quenville to keep going. And it's not just the report. The findings were damning enough. Joel Quenville basically saying on more than one occasion that it was more important for the Blackhawks to focus on trying to win a Stanley Cup in their first Stanley Cup appearance since uh, 1992. And it, I, I just... There are no words to me to describe the, I want to say anger and and just pure bewilderment that Joel Quenville was allowed to coach a game in the National Hockey League on Wednesday night. It's a privilege to play in the NHL. It's a privilege to coach in the NHL, to be on an NHL bench. The fact that the NHL and the Florida Panthers can now 24 hours later agree that this incident should have cost him his job. The Panthers saying it's quote, inexcusable. What happened? Why wasn't it inexcusable 24 hours ago? Why is it so hard for this league that trips and falls all over itself, seemingly on the regular to get it right? How, like, even if you thought that Joel Quenville was in the clear, even if, Gary Bettman is sitting there saying, I read the report and I want to do my own investigation. How about you're on administrative leave? You're suspended pending hearing. It happens to players all the time. Why can't they do it to a coach, let alone one as powerful and as high paid and well-respected in the industry as, as Joel Quenville was? I don't get it. And here's, here's where I think the NHL has so much to learn and so much to gain after yet another misstep is that when I look at this situation that played out again for the undefeated Florida Panthers on Wednesday night, it was another instance of a team, a business, a league putting winning and on ice success over 
health and safety and, and the protection of people and players. Because that's what happened in 2010, if we're being real. That that was the colossal failure that they said, us winning is more important than getting rid of this serial sexual predator that's in our dressing room and celebrating with our team. And they did it again on Wednesday night. That's to me is what, what is inexcusable here. Yes, it was time. Yes, Joel Quenville needed to go. Glad that they recognized that. And it is a momentous time, a, a huge, you know, this is one of those things that you're going to mark down in NHL history and say, this is a moment of change, hopefully. But why do they need to be pushed to this point? Yeah, the key word there is hopefully for me, Frank, because um, hockey for me is a real microcosm of society overall. And, and if you look at society and how we view sexual assault, it's not the, the NHL reacts to it exactly how we do in society. Unfortunately, it's when you want to talk about, you know, like a pandemic, that's what there's a pandemic of sexual assault in the world that's gone on. And in hockey, everybody knows about, of course, Larry Nasser in gymnastics. You look at, uh, you know, you, you go over the pond and you look at soccer and uh, there's massive cases of it there. It's it's happening in, in households, uh, unfortunately. And I don't, and I don't, I think at some point, hopefully this is a, a starting point. Like when people were able to watch Kyle Beach, and I think, I think what's the the dark little secret that no one ever talks about, right? Like if you, I remember honestly, Frank, the first movie I ever saw that had like a a reference of a of a real sexual assault scene was Jodie Foster in The Accused, and I remember watching it and being like, because it really depicted on what it's like. And it's way worse than any of us imagine, right? And so what, what's sad about the Blackhawks, and you're right, is the thing that, that really irks me the most is he was a video coach. He wasn't, like, it, most teams had two video coaches, right? Like, are you telling me, like, that you you couldn't have won games without a video coach at the Stanley Cup final at that point? Like, give me a break. It and was then the you're... distraction. It was the damage to their brand. It was all those things. They didn't want this this time when they're raking in all this dough, it's not the three, four, $5 million they were getting in a home gate at the Stanley cup final. It was all the merch they were selling, all the other things going on, all the celebration. But if you they fire Brad, if you fire Brad Aldrich, you don't have to announce why you just, you don't even have to announce it. Who would have known, right? You could have said, Brad, you're done. We'll deal with this after, but you're not allowed around the team. No one would have that's, known. That's the part that I just don't, I, I, I you're right. It, it doesn't seem that difficult. I can't for the life of me believe. And I was talking about this today with another NHL head coach. And I said to him, how much time do you spend around your video coach? And he said, untold number of hours per day. I need him to help me with something on my computer. Look over this file, come sit next to me and let's go through this. How upon hearing this did Joel Quenville operate with this guy sitting five feet away from him for even for two weeks, let alone two minutes or two hours too much. How is that possible? Yeah. I, like this Just thing to that... be on the, the little short bus that coaches get on or sit next to him in the same area of the plane. And like, I don't understand how you could hear something like that and say, nah, we're good. We're going to keep this guy part of our team. Well, what? The... The thing that I'd like to know is how in depth and detail was the initial conversation, right? That of what, because um, in my experience, my mother, unfortunately, was, was a victim of sexual assault when she was very young. And you know what? So she didn't talk about it for many years. And so I've had conversations with her over the years about it. And she's done a lot of therapy and she's talked to a lot of, the, a lot of other survivors about it. And so many people, and they never should, but they always feel guilty. They feel like I did something wrong. And, and, and some people can never really get to the point where they talk in depth about it. So I, to me, I'm always curious, and this is the curiosity factor in me is what was the initial conversation? And it doesn't matter. Like, I'm not, I'm not excusing Chicago at all, but like, I wonder how, like, if, if you're Kyle beach, like how much could, what he was only 20 years old, Frank, he had played six minor hockey league games in the AHL. That's it. And this happens to him. Like I give him so much credit for even saying something because we know most people are like, well, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to do anything. And he had the courage. That's probably what doesn't get talked about enough is mm, he had really the good point. courage 
to say this as a 20 year old rook he's not even an nhl rookie he's played six ahl games for that year he gets called up to a black ace and this predatory piece he had of everything shit, to lose i'm sorry it just he had everything to lose and he still did it and that's like when i watched him with rick westhead and he and he talked about how you know what people he finally felt like someone believed him and i think that's what people have to understand now is the importance when you hear and it doesn't have to be a, a pro athlete it doesn't have to be that like because there's lots of people who are just average jills and average joes who get assaulted and people oh yeah that didn't happen oh you give me a break i didn't hear that with kyle beach why because he spoke publicly and, and it's really hard for people to think that someone would lie about something like that to put it out there like that and for him though to think back frank 11 years ago that to me is what i find the most courageous thing about kyle beach is that he had the guts at the time to say it and that's what makes it even more infuriating is the blackhawks didn't listen yeah it's not like he's saying this now and kept it under wraps and didn't say anything because i think that's what everyone is suspect in terms of and again not even saying that that discredits or takes away from anyone that would step up and make a claim now, but that's the knock on it from society and people. It's like, well, that occurred 11 years ago. Where were you then? Kyle Beach was in the arena standing up and ready to be counted, and they discredited him, said that his, his claims had no merit, and that was this summer they said that his claims had no merit. Yeah. I want to pause for one second because – I made this point on our show today, and you just used the term piece of shit to describe uh, Brad Aldrich, who, by the way, his name needed to be um, taken off the Stanley Cup and crossed out with X's yesterday, uh, waiting on the Chicago Blackhawks to make that claim uh, and have that happen. But I feel like in some ways, uh, talking about all this, that we're so curious and so focused on Joel Quenville, Stan Bowman, Al McIsaac. We're so focused on Kevin Cheveldayoff. I don't think we talked nearly enough about the pure evil yes. of Brad Aldrich. Thank you. Yes, 100% agreed, man. Pure evil that continued in multiple other jurisdictions after the fact, partially because of the Chicago Blackhawks and the way that the sickening way that they allowed him to exit and slither out of that organization, you know, to replay the timeline for everyone, in case you haven't had a chance to dig through the report or read the stories, they have this meeting on May 23rd after the Blackhawks win the West and advance to the final, all the executives involved, Stan Bowman, John McDonough, the president and CEO, EVP of business, Jay Blunk, um, Assistant GM Kevin Cheveldayoff, GM Stan Bowman, uh, and Senior VP of Hockey Ops Al McIsaac. Those were the guys in the room, and they exited there and said, "We're you know, there's a challenge of winning the Stanley Cup. Let's this is a distraction. Let's keep the focus on the team." I'm paraphrasing the words from the report. That was the gist of it. The Hawks win the Stanley Cup in Philly. I was in the building June 9th, um, June 10th. The celebrations continue. Brad Aldrich is part of it. At that point, four days after the fact, so wait, back up a sec, June 10th, Brad Aldrich sexually assaults another Blackhawks employee, an intern. Then on June 14th, finally after everyone, you know, their hangover is over from the celebrations, John McDonough comes into the to HR for the Blackhawks and reports this gets it off his chest after three plus weeks since the team had at least the, the first documented meeting about it, even though Kyle Beach revealed in his interview with, with Rick Westhead this week that there were multiple previously, which continued to help uh, damn Joel Quenville and his standing. But then they bring in this serial sexual predator in Brad Aldrich, and they say, you have an option, a choice. Yeah. You can either resign or you can undergo an investigation. He chose to resign, but here's the other sick layers to it. He asked and negotiated to have his traditional day with the Stanley Cup, in which he brought it to a high school, which allowed him to be around other young minors for the day with the cup in a, in a, in a position of power 
with that Stanley Cup. He got paid through August 31st on his regular salary, then collected $20,000 in severance pay and was in the building in the United Center for the banner raising ceremony. That October, his name was etched on the Stanley Cup and he got a celebratory championship ring. Can you imagine to think that that's how this organization treated this guy on the way out when at that point, everyone knew they had told HR. That's a, I didn't hear anyone at any point say what a failure for HR that is as well. I, I didn't hear anyone mention that this week. Can you imagine that that's how that circumstance played itself out? It's a very good point, Frank. And what, what I found interesting in, in the comments was when, when I asked Duncan Keith about, um, you know, his interactions with, with Aldridge at the time and, you know, uh, you know, if the organization said, and they told him um, that, uh, and th this was near training camp when he came back because Aldrich wasn't there. And he was like, geez, we're a championship team. He left and there. And the excuse was they told him at this. So keep in mind, Frank, this is now close to training camp September. And they still were hiding it from their own players by saying, according to Duncan Keith, they told him that, well, he couldn't handle the, uh, the, the responsibility and, and the, uh, the amount of time it took to be in the NHL. That's not what Joel Quenville's glowing review said. That was in the report. Yeah, I know. That's... Bradley Aldrich did a great job handling this, that, and the other. I tweeted it a couple days ago. I highlighted it from the report. Congrats on winning the Stanley Cup! Exclamation point. Yeah, like that. That's honestly... after he already resigned. Two yeah. weeks after he already resigned, saying, "You know, we're he's basically being pushed out for for sexually assaulting two members of the staff." No, like I, the, how those, do you write that? Yeah. Those are the, the parts of it that I, I think a lot of people, Frank, um, and I talked to a psych, a psychologist about this. So many people don't want to believe when a human being that they're capable of doing that to another human being. And, and, and so they'll convince themselves that it's not as bad or they don't hear the details. And so they don't want to read. And that's why you told people, you know, maybe if you haven't read the report, I strongly encourage any hockey fan to read the report. You don't have to read all of it, but you should read this series when, when it explains what happened between Beach and Aldrich. And it's not pretty. It's really hard to read. It can be gut wrenching, but that's what sexual abuse is. It's not pretty. It's not easy to read. And if, if more people can, can read it and understand it and become uncomfortable with it at first, they might be more comfortable to have the courage to talk about it and stop it in the future when you see it and not kick the can down the road. Well, out of sight, out of mind, because clearly that's what the Hawks did. And I think in all of this, like, Aldridge that's, and you're right, yeah. Frank. We, we that's don't. That's what the hockey community and world has done for so long. Yes. No, you're, you're bang on. They just that... out of sight, out of mind. That stuff doesn't happen. I, I think the other part of it, I think that's a really good point. The other part of it is that the, the full 26 minute Kyle Beach interview should be mandatory appointment viewing as part of a training series for anyone that has any level of power in any sport anywhere. Front office, coaching. I don't care if you're coaching youth sports. It's not just oh. about what he went through. It's also exactly a manual on what not to say to a person who was abused. When you see his reaction to the skills coach for the Chicago Blackhawks saying to him, it's your fault that it happened you shouldn't have been there anyway, man, that's tough. That was gut wrenching. And I, I think the other part, and it's not just that the other part that really, really made me angry this week, just to get this off my chest is the way the Blackhawks used Kyle beach or tried to use Kyle beach as a prop this week, commending him after he sent out after the interview in the video saying, you know, how, you know, how brave it was. We, we commend his bravery. Meanwhile, they're trying to fight him in court about it. Yeah, that, and by the way, I didn't hear at any point or see in that statement, anything from the Chicago Blackhawks saying, Hey, by the way, we're sorry for making you out to be a liar earlier this year. 
and trying to discredit you and saying that your claims in court, quote, have no merit or meritless. I didn't see that at all. And they wanted to finger point again. That's all that the Blackhawks have done this week. They haven't accepted responsibility. They have pointed the finger at every single turn they've gotten. Stan Bowman's statement, pointing it and laying it at the laying blame at the foot of President and CEO John McDonough. The Blackhawks statement on Wednesday night saying, then executives, in quotes. You know who crafted that statement? Current executives falling short again. They did it this summer trying to discredit Kyle Beach. And you know what? That brings me to another point, not to continue to go on a rant, but obviously I'm fired up about this. What? How about Gary Bettman being in charge of this whole Thank you. process Thank you. And, and meeting out this discipline and having this, this yeah. charade that goes on in New York? You know, where was the NHL when these allegations surfaced? How about stepping up and being accounted for on the leadership front? It's great to send out a statement now on, on Thursday night after Joel Quenville resigned saying that you're appalled at the way that Kyle Beach was treated. I didn't hear any of that in June and, and certainly not at the Stanley Cup final uh, at Gary Bettman's State of the Union press conference that he does. Where were you guys launching the investigation, taking the bull by the horns, instead leaving it to the Chicago Blackhawks for them to continue to spout off their mouth about how meritless these claims were? Step up. Stand up. It's, it, we're way past this point. This is not 2011. This is 2021. We're about to be in 2022. This stuff can't happen anymore. We can't have a coach going behind the bench. We can't have a league saying, oh, well, we'll see if they launch their own investigation or not. Well, Get hey, with me, it. You know, you, you mentioned in amateur sports. Now, now I, I coach minor hockey. And me too. you got to take respect in sports. It's a course in canon. You got to take other coaching levels. The number one priority of a coach is to protect his players or her players. That's the number one thing. So Joel Quenville, right, regardless of anything else, and I know that Kyle Beach wasn't on the team, but he was on the team. He's a black ace, so he's part of the team. He didn't protect him. So that's the number one thing, and then he just made it worse and added more guilt and shame to Kyle Beach, which is awful. But what about the NHLPA? What about Don Fear coming out with his quote? Well, you know, it was a doctor, and I get, again, not, not taking enough onus on themselves to say, yeah, you know what? I screwed up. Why can't anybody here say we, I screwed up? None of them have said that. that. And to me, that's what's so frustrating about this is 11 years later. Cause you, you know what, you know what the interesting thing about it is, is you look at people who, when they actually take onus of their mistakes, most people will say, okay, I don't have to like it, but I respect that you owned up to it. Who owned up to this in the NHL? Gary Bettman didn't own up to say, you know what? I didn't do my job as a commissioner. I needed to do better. I need to make sure that this doesn't happen. Don Fear didn't do it as the head of the NHLPA. Well, geez, it was a doctor, you know, and I guess we'll try to make it better. What do you mean you'll try? He's not out of the woods, just so you know. Yeah. Don Fear. No. No I one's going to hold Gary Bettman to account because he's all powerful and all knowing and all those omni words. Don Fear, I'm not certain that's the case. Um, no. I'm not certain he survives this either because I don't think a lot of people have paid attention to the report and I'm going to dig in on Friday on dailyfaceoff.com about the real issue with Don fear. It's, it, it's not December when he was contacted after, you know, first joining the PA as executive director about this Kyle beat situation and linking him to the NHLPA assistance program and getting him in front of a therapist. That's not what this is about. It's about the email that he got later, April 2011, from a, quote, player acquaintance in the report that showed that Don Fear had an email that was basically alerting him to the fact that Brad Aldrich was still involved in hockey circles yes, and still had access to other people mm -hmm. in the game of hockey and chose to not do anything about it. Now it's odd in a statement that was issued at midnight on Thursday morning, 
which I've been in this business a long time. I don't remember too many statements pinging my inbox at 11.53 PM, but I missed that part in the statement. He mentioned about you know, connecting Kyle Beach to the assistance program and getting him help. And he also apologized for not doing more, but I didn't see him address that really critical part. And I can tell you this, there are staff in the NHL PA office that are wondering about what kind of support he has internally given that course of action. As Kyle Beach said so well, you are our, you know, you're the person that's whose job it is to protect the players. Yep. And if someone comes to you with a vital piece of information, and it's not just, you know, it is of course NHL players, but it's also players in the game of hockey that he's in charge of protecting and overseeing. And if that slipped through the cracks, it sounds like there's some culpability there as well. But again, uh-huh. I need to, um, you know, that, that needs to be further reported on, but that's the crux of the issue for me from the PA. Well, and you know, what's interesting about that whole thing, Frank is, you know, the PA, sometimes they've got to protect players. You know, when it comes to suspensions or protecting two parties, Brad Aldridge has nothing to do with the NHL PA. Absolutely nothing. So their main only focus should have been what can we do for the best of Kyle Beach and then anybody else who's a hockey player. Brad Aldridge wasn't a hockey player, right? And the fact that he was around, and I think that's that's the one where everybody listening, including you and myself, I think all of us, the challenge has to come from this to be more diligent, to have the courage, because trust me, it takes a lot of courage Look at Kyle Beach, and I talked about it earlier. I don't think he gets enough credit for the courage that it took for a 20-year-old rookie to go say something at that point, to tell somebody. That that is, it's it's immensely, immensely powerful that he had the courage to do that. I don't even know if he knows that, but I sure hope he does because that's not the norm in situations like this. Most people won't say anything for a long time because they're scared and humiliated. Never mind to do it to to people that, that really controlled your fate. Right. He's a first round pick. He's like, geez, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to come in here and have people thinking ill thoughts of me or, or thinking that, you know, maybe I'm a liar. I'm they're not going to believe me. or I'm a bad guy. Yeah. Or all those, those typical cliches that you hear about why people don't speak up. Yeah. You know, I, you know, another reason why people don't speak up. Cause they don't get listened to and they don't get believed that. But I also think that some of the players themselves this week hurt the process. Jonathan Taves. We talk about character and leadership and all these qualities that he oozes. Hearing Kyle Beach tell his story, seeing some of the dust ups that he had, the, if I'm not mistaken, had a giant fight, 2011 training camp, 2010, 2011 training camp. I can't imagine with all the chirps that we heard in the report and, and different words being thrown around that that rumor and innuendo wasn't flying through that room at any points whether it was in the playoffs or the following training camp to think that people didn't know. So I, I mean, I, I guess in some ways we have to take some of these players at their word. Duncan Keith, to your point, didn't participate in the investigation and more to Jonathan Taves and the leadership part. He pretty clearly seemed to back Stan Bowman and Al McIsaac saying quote they were not directly culpable here yeah i'm not sure what that means like is is he just saying because they weren't the ones who sexually assaulted beach is that what he's trying to say no i think he's saying more finger pointing as to how i've understood and 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 read through the quote and the audio is this is on john mcdonough this isn't yeah. on Stan Bowman. This is on the top guy, which is, the buck. it's been the Blackhawks message the whole time. It was Jonathan Taves, their captain, sitting at the podium, perpetuating the same message. Yeah, like I, Let's lay it at the feet of John McDonough, who was fired in 2020 and is, is somewhat known throughout league circles as an unsavory character as it is. Let's just leave it on him. Yeah. And you know what? Hey, he, he might have been the guy who had to make the ultimate decision, but here, here's the thing. Tough decisions, Frank, take courage. And, we, and you use the word character. Well, that to me should take character to say, hey, Kyle Beach showed enough character to voice what happened to him, yet nobody in that room had enough to say, hey, wait a sec, guys. This isn't right. I don't care if I'm not the president. 
right? Stan Bowman, you're the GM. That's a pretty high ranking position last I checked. Like I can understand if it wasn't, you know, the skills coach isn't like, well, maybe not me, but you're the GM for God's sakes. Are you telling me that you can't have the courage? Because GMs always tell me they want their scouts to be very vocal when they disagree on things. So you're telling me in a situation like this, everybody's in the room like, you know what, guys? Yeah, this is a really good idea. Let's let's hide this now because that's the best for everybody. That nobody had the courage to say something that, and trust me, I know it's difficult, but the other, that's what I think we, we probably haven't touched on enough is that collectively they all agreed to keep it silent. It wasn't one person. Right. And because we haven't seen anything in report that somebody said, you know, McDonough threatened everyone. It says, if any of you say anything, you're fired. We didn't see any of that. So I have to assume that didn't occur. Which is why we shouldn't be absolving other people. And we can touch on Kevin Chevel day off as well, because his meeting is upcoming with the NHL on Friday. It was supposed to be on Monday. He bumped it up because they didn't want to have this continue to uh, linger throughout the weekend. Obviously people are calling for his head and, and him to be the next domino to fall here. Do you see uh, him in a in a slightly different role though than Quenville? Yeah, I, I do. do too. Like because now, first I would off, have liked... you can't lump everyone together. No, that's wrong. Yes, just because but... you were in that room, and and here's why: there's no absolution here. I'm not saying he should get off scot free, because any at any point, any one of those men in that room could have individually, and probably even anonymously, gone to the authorities, gone to the police, and said. We got to get rid of this guy. It's like three weeks, whatever it is, too long, not good enough. This guy needs to go. And so that's what they're all going to have to deal with for the rest of their lives in terms of, you know, thinking about that situation and thinking that another Blackhawks employee and an intern got sexually assaulted in the meantime because of their inaction. But I see him in a different light because a, he was the most junior level staffer in the room. And as a full-fledged experienced adult in this game who had been in an, in pro hockey front offices for a really long time with the Chicago Wolves, you know, there's no, you don't get a pass for that. Um, he could have stood on his own two feet and done something. But I think part of the reason why everyone has placed it on John McDonough is because I think they saw it at, and I'm, this is my own opinion. I think they saw it as, the president and the CEO saying, I'll handle it. I'll take it from here. And when you see someone up the chain of command from you, that's your general reaction and vibe. Yeah. So again, they could have all done it. They could have all done it on their own. They didn't. But not only was he mo the most junior level staffer in the room, he also departed the organization three weeks later in short order um, right after winning that cup and going to the Jets. So. And he also, Frank, there was nothing in the report of him. He didn't do what he didn't do what Joe Coinville did. There was no, nope. hey, Aldrich, you're a great guy. Congratulations on the Stanley Cup. There was he, there was really he didn't apparently he didn't say anything according yes. to the report. There's nothing in the report that indicates that he even spoke in the meeting. Yeah. And so sure, in, in a perfect world, he could have said something, but I do see him in, in a different category as guys like Bowman and Quenville who are in a there who probably are in a much should be some punishment. Position. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, I just don't know what the right answer is. I don't know what that is. No, I don't know that it's immediate loss of job like Joel Quenville. And I think the other part of it is we'll have to go back and I'm not smart enough and I don't have a legal mind to go back and read this statement that the jets issued back in July. But the point of the statement is as it's, it's been explained to me is they purposely vaguely worded that statement so that it's not indicating that Kevin Sheveldayoff didn't know anything at the time that that statement was sent out. It's basically worded in a way it's obfuscating the truth and, and, and really playing a little bit fast and loose with some of the words, but it's basically saying that Kevin Sheveldayoff didn't know anything about the allegations prior to the May 23rd, 2010 meeting among the Blackhawks front office executives. And so they worded it that way. So as to not, you know, sort of, I don't know if it's rile up or, or whatever else was going on at the time to not add fuel to the fire and the investigation that was ongoing at that point. 
But apparently in the meantime, behind the scenes, and, and really since this came to light, he's apparently been all front and center on the up and up with Winnipeg Jets ownership and their team saying, this is what I knew. This is when I knew it. This is how it happened. And again, um, tell the truth, man. It'll be ultimately up for someone to decide what that punishment is. I don't know what it is. I don't, there is no right. There's no manual here. There's no right answer to this. Um, But it seems like he's handled this in a different manner. Yeah. And that's totally fair. And I think that's accurate. The, The other thing I'm curious to see is, um, and it often in cases like this, when one person comes out and has the courage like Kyle Beach, it does inspire others. And and I'm curious to see now what what other potential victims there are of Brad Aldrich at other levels of, of hockey. We we know of course, and and man, Kyle Beach when he teared up, uh, you know, talking about the the boy in Michigan who is a who is a future victim, saying I wish I could have done more. Like that might have been the toughest part for me to watch in that whole interview. That somehow he felt like he didn't do enough. And, and and that was that was really gut wrenching for me, man. Because I've, I've said it all along. I've been <sighs> so impressed by by Kyle Beach's courage throughout the entire thing, even dating back to the first time for him to go and speak that quickly, that soon after the the uh, the horrible situation he was involved in. Like I I, I can't how say it, it that, enough. How is it that he was the first person to say sorry this week? <laughs> it's a good point, man. Does it's that really dr- good point. does that drive you crazy? Like. I, that's what I said all along. The thing that has infuriated me the most is there's been very few people to just come out and say, you know what? I could, I wish I would, I should have done more. Oh, and, and that's okay. How hard because, are those two words? Yeah, I'm because the, I, I do want to say this, Frank, a lot of us, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I would have acted perfect because I don't know how I would have acted. I've never been in a situation like that. But I would like to believe that if I didn't act properly, at least I could say, you know what? I didn't act properly then because you know what? Now the players themselves, ha- you know, we, we heard about some of the taunting and the jokes at the training camp the following year. Now in the report, even there was talk about how they thought there was some sort of consensual relationship potentially. So what they were mocking maybe wasn't even a hundred percent true. It doesn't, it doesn't excuse them because you still shouldn't do that. But there, there's so many different layers here of this where some player could at least say, you know what? Like I, I applaud, you know, Nick Boynton and, and Brent Sobel to come out and, and say what they said, but say, you know what? Hey, um, I made it an insensitive joke and I really regret it. I wish I could have done more. Now, Patrick Kane, to his credit a little bit, did he might have come the closest to anyone in their statement of apologizing, saying, I wish I would have done more. He's about the only one who at least mm-hmm. came close to like Bring a full apology. Thought, yeah, I... You know, it's funny. I called a player today that played in that 2010 Stanley Cup final on the other side, and I just said, what's what's this week been like for you? Like, what have you been thinking about? And his, his answer was, I honestly don't know what I would have done. Everything was so different then. He said, I'd like to sit here and say that I would have been a big enough guy having had some stature in the league to say, this guy's 20 years old. He doesn't know anything from anything. This is not okay. And that goes to anyone of any age, by the way. But to think that he would have been big enough to stand up and support a young player um, put in that situation. But now he he played for the Flyers. He, they didn't hear about this at the no, time. No, they didn't hear yeah. at all. And he's saying, I just hope. He said, I really can't answer the question. I, he said, I'd like to think we would have done better. But he said... Culture was so, the hockey culture was so different then. The joke, it was like, he called it the wild, wild west. Like, this is like still, this is pre-Twitter kind of. Like, this is pre a lot of social media. It's like just the beginning of camera phones. Guys were still going out all the time, doing all sorts of different stuff. Like, I, I just feel like it was, the, the things I heard in the, in the locker room then are so different than what I hear now. Like you'd never hear some of the things that you heard then. And that was only 10, 11, 12 years ago. Yeah. And, and not just in the, not just in the dressing rooms, but in society as a whole, I think. And that's hundred percent. Me- he, and he, the, the one thing we talked about um, was just the use of homophobic slurs. He's like, yeah. we have, he said, cut those out a long time ago, but he's yeah. like that back then, no one thought anything of it. Yeah. Like, cause I, my, my, the one thing that, that I found, a little troubling 
was a, a lot of people wrote afterwards, you know, toxic hockey, hockey culture and stuff. And, you know, the toxicity and toxicity, excuse me, in hockey. And I'm like, that's really, it, it's, it's almost, you use that because you can escape and rather than say, no, it's in our own society. It's at schools, mm -hmm. it's at churches, it's in the military, you know, you go everywhere. It exists. It's the same toxicity. And so all that happens is NHL puts it out there in the spotlight and it gets shown. And most people don't see it. Like, sadly, there's kids going home today who live in an abusive, sexual abusive situation. It's awful, but that's the truth. And so we have to find ways to eliminate that from society. And the, the toxic hockey culture, quote, well, that's true, but you might as well just say the toxic society culture because that's the fact yeah, on where but it is. I, I get where people are coming from, and I, I want to end it here. Um there is something that reeks about hockey culture. There, and it does mirror society in a lot of ways. And I, if you haven't read Jason's story on OilersNation.com, go do it because he does make a lot of really good points. And I'm not knocking any of those at all. But there is a secrecy, a shroud of secrecy that exists in hockey that I don't – I've covered all the four major pro sports in the U.S. I've never seen it like anywhere where it is in hockey – it's uh, there's a feeling of the hockey locker room. You've heard the term, what happens in the room stays in the room. And th that's our quote, inner sanctum. You hear these things a lot and that gives the, and it's given the, not just the perception, but the reality of this idea that anything goes because it's the boys, because it's our team. And anything that happens in there, no one rats. It's got, there's sort of this mob mentality. And I say mob in the mafia sense that whatever happens there, you take it to your grave. And, and that's not, that's not real. That's no, not but, the way this works. No, but so, that's, that's the same in my interactions in football, Frank. I've seen it in, in rugby, you know, and I'm, I'm not picking on any sports but here. There's so far, there's football culture to me is so far advanced from what hockey is in terms you of think? inclusivity and yeah, a hundred percent. Look mm. at how diverse those locker rooms are. Hockey's homogenous. Well, it is you, more there's diverse. No, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no difference. Everyone's the same there. And it's, and the people that are different are ostracized. Look at like, like, look, look at something as stupid as Dougie Hamilton being made fun of because he likes museums and libraries. Like how insane is that, that that's something that was like a thing. We need to get rid of this guy because he likes to read. Like what? <laughs> I mean, so, I, and this is where I wanted to end it. It's just that there's a lot of really positive things about hockey culture, charity, the way that people in this sport pick you up when you're down. I lived it, felt it, saw it in humble. It's real. But there are a lot of shitty things about hockey culture that continue to drag the sport down in the eyes of the public and in the eyes of other people who would like hockey but don't want to deal with the BS that comes with it. No, and no, I think hey, there's this some truth week to that. showed that there is some hopeful progress being made, but also that there's a really freaking long way to go. Ugh, Hashtag nice. rant over. Yeah, well, it's true. There's a there's a long way to go in, in in sports and and in life, and that's why um, in that article, Frank, I, I purposely you know put in some average everyday people. And um, when you when you have own families who want to try to cover up their own sexual assaults, like it's it's such a rampant issue. And I don't, I'm not a psychologist. There's times when you know I'm I'm very curious about. It. I've taken a few courses on it. It intrigues me why our human race and you you talk about when you get into that that mafia kind of thing where you're, you're built on that it's a gang mentality in a, in a way and, and obviously that that festers and grows even more when you're around and it and it's us against the world all the time mentality taylor I think hall you're, called you're, it a quote secrecy right? secrecy and, and he said but the military you know yeah the military has it it's it's alive everywhere and i i i do want to end my the only thing i want to end with is um I hope that Kyle Beach realizes that he's a lot stronger than, than maybe he thought he was at times. He talked about how 11 years almost crushed him. Well, it didn't crush him, and he's still standing. And uh, he's a beacon of hope for, for a lot of people. Um, I also hope for all, this, all the voiceless 
survivors because sadly there's many of them. I hope people see them and I hope people listen. The next time someone tells you something horrific happened to them, don't question them. Don't say, well, are you sure? What were you wearing? Just listen to them because the one thing I got from Kyle Beach was what you could see in his voice and his body language and almost like his shoulders, like he exhaled when he talked about the fact that finally someone believed him and he wasn't alone. And I think we should all remember that, that that the, the most powerful thing you could do to someone right now is believe them and listen to them when they tell you they've been a victim of sexual assault. Well said. Well, that wraps. It's a, you know what? I know it's a tough subject and uh, we'll get back to a lot of hockey talk, but today we felt like this was uh, this was something that was important uh, to discuss. So I want to thank uh, DoorDash, of course, one of the sponsors of the show. If, uh, hey, you, you need something delivered to your house right now. It's been a tough week, as Frank mentioned. Get me uh, a go milkshake. through the, the DoorDash app and get a milkshake. Um, somebody tried to tell me that they don't even like Girl Guides chocolate mint cookies. What? Geez, I would order some of those from DoorDash. So uh, first-time users, you get 25% off when you use the promo code RUNDOWNDD if you're a first-time user and free delivery. So uh, get something, and hopefully uh, everybody in the hockey community has a better week next week. Thanks for listening to the DFO Rundown with Saravali and Gregor. Keep it locked on dailyfaceoff.com and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode. Delivered by DoorDash.